right. <coughs> Excuse me. Call to order the Monday, November 21st meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, reported by ACMI. Uh, beginning our agenda this evening is a continuation of public hearing for EDR Special Permit Docket 3520. Hearing is now open. Uh, 117 Broadway, the Housing Corporation of Arlington, is the proponent. Uh, please step forward. Left Thank off last time. Thank you, Mr. Pennell, members of the board. Uh, with me, my name is Mary Lynn Stanley O'Connor. I represent the Housing Corporation of Arlington. With me is Pamela Hallett, the executive director, and from Davis Square Architects, Paul Warburton, and Cliff Coleman. Um, there were a number of issues that uh, the board had asked us to address, uh, and I'm going to leave it to the architects to address the uh, landscaping uh, and some of the other issues that were uh, asked you asked us to fill in and then we can talk about the traffic <coughs> and the plan. Okay. Hi, I'm Cliff Palmer, Davis Square Architects. I'm going to briefly start by talking a little bit about where we were in the comments we heard. And then uh, Paul will get, get you up to speed on where we, uh, how we continue to develop the design. Uh, this, this is where we were last time we were here and uh, bring up some of the comments that were brought just so um, everybody remembers. Our goal really was to uh, respond uh, as thoroughly as we possibly could to all of the comments. Uh, you probably remember that we talked about showing the screening of mechanical equipment, and you'll see on revised elevations, Paul will talk to you about that. Uh, we talked about adding planting to provide some relief, particularly along where the parking is, planting space along the parking area. We've worked on that. Uh, screening along the schoolyard. And we do have a, a landscape plan that is included in the package that you have. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, narrowing down the curb cut, which we were able to do. Uh, bike parking, we now added another whole uh, area of bike parking to the plan. Uh, the elevations, we got a lot of comments about making the lowest level really more of a commercial look, increasing the, the openness of that lower level. Uh, and uh, the issue of the transformer came up. We have a location that we want to put the transformer. It, it is something that's very difficult to commit to until we're actually negotiating with the utility. But we know where on the site plan we want to put the transformer. And uh, so I think those are the big points that came up. So uh, this time we don't get confused about which is where we are now and uh, where we were before. And Paul will walk you through some of the details. Thank you. So as we, uh, in looking at our exterior elevations, one of the comments was is having a larger amount of glazing and storefront across the commercial area at the bottom. We put that along the curved corner here and also opened up more section of windows along uh, the bottom of, at this side. We also had some comments about the the, the, the way this, this curve looked here up at the top. It's sort of a blank uh, space up there. We, so we added some windows to that, sort of made that the major feature of that, uh, that corner unit also modified in the uh, we show that for a comparison there. So we have this, it's just this sort of smooth curve, and now it sort of works in a little bit better with the uh, the rest of the top cornice there. Um, so moving along, this did this view did not change a lot, although you are seeing a little, a little bit more of the uh, storefront along that side. Here are elevations. I won't go through all the elevations, but again, the, the storefront showing the windows along there, mechanical screen across the top. You know, we we're showing this mechanical screen as being about six feet tall. You can't even see it from the renderings. I mean, this that is in the model of all these renderings, but because it's far enough back um, over this area of the plant, it doesn't even register in the. Uh, from the street for the most part, unless you're staying a lot further back away from it. Um, looking at the plan, so we're showing now a six foot solid wood fence across the property line in the back. We allocated a, an area outdoors at this point with a uh, metal, metal screen fence for bike parking. Uh, we're thinking that this could, we, we, we have vertical racks where you 
and your wheels up vertically along there. That would be some cold uh, 12 bytes. Uh, we showed a bike, park, bike storage area on the inside. We would much rather prefer the exterior just because it has a lot more capacity and you don't have bikes with money tires coming into the inside uh, part of that space. Um, and, it, and it works well in that location. The, uh, the transfer location that Cliff is talking about, we want to bring that to the back part of the lot here, as we said, it would be a negotiation between us and the utility because they'd have to run their primaries all the way through there. So you know, that, that's where we would want to be able to locate that. Um, again, we ran our plans to show the changes to the, to the uh, glazing along that side. Um, planning thinking is trying to maximize the ways we can the, uh, the, the narrow areas of grant planting that we have at the edges of the sidewalk along here. We have some planter boxes along the, uh, along the front. We want to keep that as, as a, a larger area of pavement so it potentially could be used as, uh, as outdoor space. But then also putting in some uh, street trees along the front as well. Um, moving up into the interior of the building, you know, we did not have major changes to this, but we did show the enclosed uh, bike storage at, at a larger scale at this time. Uh, going along there on, on the, this mesh, we have a door coming from the outside uh, to be able to access all of that. Um, but other changes to these plans, we did really didn't have a lot of other changes to these. Um, and uh, we also, there were some questions about the uh, floor area ratio. And I, we uh, did some recalculation of that. We took the, uh, the under, under zoning where uh, we have a baseline of 1.5 FAR. We increased that by 20% based on our uh, because this is affordable housing. Um, and so that got us to 1.8, which is where we are in terms of, the, in terms of our uh, floor area ratio with our total square footage of the building, 19,430. So that, again, remains unchanged from the, uh, from the initial application. Um, that was. A, I think there's a plan here. Oh, I was trying to figure out what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, we specific there's no specific. No, there isn't. I thought I plan. see something called a landscape light and a light bollard. This is all existing. That's all existing? Put the ball in? No. No, there's nothing there. I don't think there's anything there. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we address any specifics about the light. Um, yeah, but that's right in the parking lot. I, I guess the, I, ball, the ball is going to be there. Our, our goal with lighting is would be, you know, kind of in accordance with our lead principles, we'd be wanting to have it have a, you know, dark sky compliant, but it's still have. Uh, plenty of lighting around at the uh, in sockets over over doorways, which are around dark spots around the, the corners of the buildings, particularly in the bike parking area um, and overhang areas. We want to have that pretty well lit. I think our, our intentions at the rear parking lot is would be that we would, we would have some uh, some wall lighting that would have cutoffs in order to not over illuminate beyond the limits of the parking lot itself. Okay. Um, 
on special conditions, is that something that we have in there, those lighting plans and stuff like that? Yeah. Be? Uh, there is a document that you receive in your packets yep. that has proposed, um, changed, revised conditions. Yeah, right. If you, if you, I don't know if you're ready to talk about that yet. Uh, okay, no, I'll let everyone else go. Go ahead. <coughs> well, I commend you guys on your changes. Uh, I think you guys addressed uh, most of the issues we had. Um, when Andy, uh, Mr. West there, uh, mentioned about uh, making the bottom more retail-like, he definitely did do that, and it does look much, much better. The corner is opening up a lot more uh, above and below. Um, <coughs> on the fourth floor, you have a balcony that runs along the outside perimeter for those three units. Mm -hmm. Do you guys propose to have any wing walls there to separate those uh, balconies between the units so it would be shown, so you would see it on the elevation, or it's just a, a, a continuing um, balcony that goes through it? There's no real, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we could certainly separate those. That would be, and, and would be preferred that we do that. Um, uh, we also, you know, we're, I mean, the main rationale for it, as we talked about last time, for that whole setback was to not have it be as vertical at the at the No, I think you did that a good job. Section. I'm just wondering, is, are you going to see a little wing coming out along the rail? I think, I think since the, the top part of this is a, is a metal rail, the, the inner part of that would also be a metal rail. So it wouldn't register as a... I don't think that would be registering as a, okay, a so thicker it's, piece at the top. So that... The, that wall is just a separation, it's not a visual screen right. between the uh, two balconies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're not, you're not going to see it, like you said. No, no. Gonna... Oh, you're, you're thinking like it would be a wall. I don't know. No, no, I don't know. Exactly. Okay. It's a question. Yeah, no. We didn't draw that. No. No. Okay. It would be a metal wall. Yeah, okay. it would be a metal wall. And I just want to refer back a little more uh, what Mike said about um, the site lighting. So you guys plan to have wall packs on the back of the building which would shine on the, the back half of the parking. You not have any light poles or anything else that will be lighting the, uh, the we back have door. We a lot of space on the site, so we certainly would prefer wall packs with cut-offs. Okay. And there, there are street lights out there already, so we don't need a tremendous amount of additional light. Maybe we don't want to just spread the light over on the into the park, in the ballpark. Yes. Yeah. And, and in fact, I, I think because we have the taller building, we could, we might be able to mount them higher and have it point them they down. Be that, that a light, we may, might be able to get better wood uh, from a uh, from a light pole. Anyway. Yeah. Certainly, on, and certainly any light poles that were, you know, I mean, where would we put it? It's, it's, it, it's, it's, it just makes things work. So. And my last question is, uh, you show parking in the back there. What is dedicated for retail and what is dedicated for the housing? Uh, I mean, is it shared so during the daytime, uh, the tenants are thought to go to work and they drive to work and it leaves more open spaces for the retail or is it that just... Is thought. That is the thought, that basically the retail space would utilize it during the day, tenants would utilize it at night. And we will not be um, allowing, there are 17 spaces, the tenants will not have access to all 17 spaces. They will have a designated space with a sticker on their car. And we're anticipating probably half or less of the tenants having a parking space. And when we get to the transportation demand management plan, we'll go over um, the thinking. Okay, so there's, so on the uh, transportation management plan, it designates how many parking spaces are retail, how many parking spaces are for uh, residential, how many spaces are shared? No, it does not, but we can, we can speak to that if you'd like. But uh, what we're proposing uh, in part is, uh, and I would talk about the transportation demand management plan in the context of the draft special conditions. If, if you want me to get to that now, or do you want to wait? I don't know, Dandy's call. You can get to that now. Okay. That'd be uh, I think that you, and I will also add, you have the green components for the project, um, a very detailed list of, uh, for this project and for Downing Square. Uh, with respect to the transportation demand management plan, uh, Ms. Hallett has put together a much more detailed plan 
uh, as you requested. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about uh, was, you know, the special condition uh, talks about reviewing the situation and maybe coming up with alternatives. What we would propose instead is a condition and, and term in the lease, in each tenant's lease. And this is 14 units, two of which are only one bedroom, the other 12 are multi-unit, that each unit may have not more than one car. So that in the lease we would provide one car at the most on a first come, first serve basis. And we can limit the number of spaces for residential tenants so that there are several for the commercial tenants as well. So um, we would agree to that type of condition to be added to the lease to be enforced by the landlord. So that would be another component that we could add to the transportation demand management plan. That's how we operate now. <laughs> that when a tenant leases a unit, they get a space as part of the lease or they do not. And you can see that uh, there's incentives provided in the draft plan that provides for negotiations with Zipcar. It's too far out at this point for Zipcar to make an affirmative um, agreement that they will provide a Zipcar. If you haven't built it, it could be two or three years out. Um, language that says, shall use their best efforts to secure a Zipcar or an alternative like Zipcar, at least one space in the lot. The other is to charge for the parking at $100 a month and to give uh, a credit for each unit owner for a uh, MBTA pass. So that is all in the plan uh, that we propose. So you, you guys did contact Zipcar, right? Yes, yes, I got in touch with them. Yes. They come back to me and Thank they you. said, are you kidding, 2018, you want to negotiate now? <laughs> so I tried to offer them a space that's in the current site. They're considering it. Okay. Thank I'll you. let you know. So we haven't sent this to discourage <coughs> I still don't know the number though. I just well, is it half? Is it a third? I, I would say I, I mean, we, expect it, we expect it to be half. So seven of the, um, well there's 17 spaces, so half of them we assume will be in a tenant lease and they will have the right to park there. The rest of them will be- 24-7. 24-7. Okay. And the rest of them, there will be one shared space if we get Zipcar to uh, go ahead and lease it. Um, and then the rest will be retail. Retail slash visitors, visitors yeah. at night. Right. So, so right. we really off. Or during the day, depending on what the retail is. Yes. Okay. Not, to, not to interrupt, Kit, but to, to piggyback on that question. <clears throat> your, your intent, as I recall, and from the application, is that a bulk of the retail space will be for the food pantry. What and food lake? And food lake. What kind of car traffic do you have there now? What kind of foot traffic do you have there? Do you have numbers? More foot there? traffic. Um, the food pantry has 76 families that come um, twice a month. They're planning to open more days starting in January. We don't know what that will do, whether that will reduce the number of families that come at one time or whether more people come. We don't, we don't know yet what that will do. Um, the majority of them do not have cars. The majority of them either walk or come on the bus. Um, anytime when the food pantry is open, there are no more than five cars in the parking lot at this point. So we don't anticipate that changing dramatically. Okay. <clears throat> and when you begin to market the additional retail space there, what kind of use do you anticipate using to? Um, well, we've had several inquiries. Uh, one was for an after school program. Um, I think they want too much space. I don't think we'll have that much square footage. Uh, one was for a coffee shop sandwich kind of place that would be open in the morning and only until about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, another was for a bank, just a small branch. Um, I think that's as much as we've actually <coughs> had a conversation. But we don't have pricing yet, so it's very difficult for people to sort of make a... Yeah, I, I understand that's kind of a specific question. I'm just trying to get sense of the traffic impact yeah. based on the use. Yeah. Yeah. on similar spots in town. Kid, did you have anything further? I would just piggyback off you're saying that I would encourage um, leasing up that third space or the remaining space, something that would activate the street so it adds some life to the street because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it goes back to our philosophy of multifamily and having 
um, an active streetscape. I don't think it, I don't think we can write that into a special condition. But no, I think it's the opinion of the board that we'd like to see something mm -hmm. that benefits the community, not a bank. Well, and that's certainly where we come from too. That's why something like a coffee shop or even a, an after-school program where people are coming in and going, you know, is uh, something that we want to see. I mean, this is our first uh, push into that commercial district, and we'd love to see it be uh, a real push towards more development over time. And that's having that kind of activity would be better. David. Uh, I've got a couple of questions about the plans, but uh, uh, most of my questions are about the, the TDM plan. Um, do you know what the square footage of the space allocated uh, for, for the uh, for the bike parking is, or more the dimensions than the square footage? Um, Responsive to that comment from last time, I, I think this is a big improvement, um, and it's is more uh, in line with what people are, are looking for these days. Um, and and just generally, I would agree with the rest of the board uh, that uh, I, I like what you've done in response to, to many of the comments uh, about the 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 design of of, uh, of the facade. So. Um, I would uh, just uh, ask you to think, uh, and this is maybe a, a thought that will come later when you get into the real details, um, hanging bikes on, uh, like you're mentioning, is, yeah. is, is a good use of space. It's very high density parking, but um, for someone who's got a heavy bike or isn't very strong or has one of the newer, larger cargo bikes, that's not going to work. So yeah. when you actually get to the point of designing the specifics of what's going to go in that in that space, uh, keep that in mind. I, as, as a long time biker, I totally hear that. But we're definitely moving in the right direction. Um, one thing I, I didn't see, I saw it mentioned in the TDM plan that there would be a, a U rack uh, on at the side entry on Everett Street. Yeah. So we so this is as we were going back and forth with our engineer and, and, and on the landscape plan and the planning plan and the architecturals. This essentially he had he had drawn the rack being a certain kind of way. We had progressed on to something else. Frankly, didn't have a chance to get him to change his go back in time. Well, there's nothing wrong with a U rack out, out out on the street. I, oh, I, on the street. I, I see, yeah, yeah. I, on the street. I set up the side entry. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, so I wasn't sure. Uh, we had talked about the need for three types of bike parking for the residents, for residential visitors, and for retail customers. And I wasn't quite clear uh, how you were addressing uh, residential visitors and and the commercial. Uh, the retail customers. There's a number of ways we could we could address that. I mean, one might be to to have some some smaller, uh, almost the, uh, the 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 style that, we, that one puts on uh, on uh, parking meters. We could put ring, those ring along, post. Like follow posts along in the front. Because I think for those yeah. who really want to have those near corners to the, to the retail. Absolutely. Places. So um, that would be my first thought. And, and I think essentially that, you know, considering the number of visitors one might have to the residential area, I think that solution would probably suffice for that as well. Yeah. Um, so I think one, one, uh, one decent approach for that would be to locate a few of those along uh, inside the property line, adjacent to the sidewalk and strategic locations. Uh, 
you know, adjacent or around planters. That, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, the kind of it would also thinking. still be underneath yeah. the uh, awnings that we have along mm -hmm. there yeah. and be able to, to still have some shelter. Yeah. All right, as long as you're thinking about it, um, but I would like uh, uh, that to be clear in the TDM plan that you are thinking about not just the residents, but also the visitors and, and the retail customers. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the TDM plan, if, if now's a good time to talk more about that. It is. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for going into much more detail. Um, this, this is a, a very substantial improvement over what we saw last time. Um, and I, I understand that you're uh, uh, not in a position to know for sure whether Zipcar is, is going to want to move forward. Um, and uh, I think, uh, do, you, do you know what your plan B is to replace that element if Zipcar doesn't? Uh, bite? <laughs> Actually, no, I've been trying to think that um, you know, it might be a easy access to Lyft driver or Uber or something like that, but actually I don't have an optimal alternative. Uh, well, I'd, I'd encourage you to think more about that and, and look at, at the list of, of acceptable um, strategies, uh, just, just to kind of have that in your back pocket in, in case the car doesn't mm -hmm. come through. Uh, <laughs> And I like uh, that you're talking about paying the initial membership fee yes. uh, for Zipcar. Mm -hmm. And do you have you had any experience doing something similar um, at your other properties? Well, no, actually, we never have done that. Yeah. Um, we never have. No. Do you do you know what what uh, common practice is if if there is a common practice among? Uh, well, I know that companies sometimes. Yeah have a membership and anyone that uh, actually uh, uses it, they, they actually do that. They, they often come out of the zip card. And uh, so the company basically pays the fee and then you sort of trade off the, the, what, the little card the, that you have. You go to the project. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or, you know, we can do it the opposite way is what I was thinking is pay for each initial membership of the households that would tend to want to use it yeah. and then you know they take care of the charges beyond that. Okay. Well I, th I think um, there, uh, I think in combination with uh, another piece that you've talked about which is providing a $25 monthly credit against rent um, for transit passes. Yes. Um, I, I think you, you could also think about extending a similar credit to people uh, for things like uh, Zipcar mm -hmm. or a Hubway membership, or even just by commuting expenses, there is some precedent. Um, there is a federal bicycle commuter tax benefit that that uh, businesses can take advantage of, um, and that's that's something to think about. Yeah. Where, where the business actually pays for some of the bike commuters' expenses because it, it essentially um, equalizes the value assigned right. to the different transportation modes, so you're not just subsidizing people sure, parking or, or taking transit, but you're also you're also encouraging them I think to, it's been to bike. Um, Thank you. Uh, the hundred dollar a month parking space charge. Mm -hmm. um, I like conceptually charging for parking because uh, it does have a value and tends to be undervalued mm -hmm. generally. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether a hundred dollars is, is the right number though. That that seems like maybe a lot, um, especially in the context of affordable housing. Um, and I don't know whether you had uh, uh, done any research into what appropriate pricing might be. Um, well, it depends on how we structure the deal with our funders as to um, whether we're going to have to keep the parking fee as part of the rent to begin with anyway or not. And okay. so that's a conversation we have to sort of feel out with both uh, the state and um, the tax credit 
those indicators and see where they come down on that. So how would that work if it had to be bundled with the rent? If it had to be bundled with the rent, HUD gives you a maximum rent that you can charge. So it would have to certainly be under that for the different size units and it changes <laughs> yearly basically. Um, and if we were capped, then for those that, um, well, what we typically do is we're significantly under those caps typically. Mm -hmm. And so what we would do is for those who wanted or needed the car space, that would increase the rent up closer to what the limits are. Is that clear? Mm, yes. Yes. So. Okay. So for instance, you might have a limit of $1,200, $1,250 for a two bedroom. Um, typically we would be about 1100 and so for someone that was getting a, a space, a parking space, they would then be 1200 but still under the cap. I see. Oh, and had you thought about um, the leases with the commercial tenants mm -hmm. uh, about including any provisions in there uh, that would require them to uh, provide incentives to their employees to uh, mm -hmm. use alternative transportation? Um, we've thought about that. Uh, two of our potential tenants are, of course, not for profits. Um, so we have to see what they could afford to begin with. Okay. Um, both of them have minimal staffs all part-timers. Um, so we'd have to see if that was even possible in their view. Um, there could be you know, just an argument at that level. On the other commercial, if they are market rate tenants, I would think that we could certainly include something on it, at least. Yeah. And prior to any tenant opening up for business, they'd have to come in front of us to put certain TDM restrictions on there as well. Yeah. I don't have anything else. <clears throat> I, I know I, I did close public comment last time, but given the fact that there are some significant changes uh, to these plans, I do want to open it up to folks in the room. Uh, if there are any questions for the applicants, except but ask that any questions be directed to board. Stand up, state your name and address, and ask. <coughs> Please. Yes, ma'am. Kim Fetchell, 46 Marion Road, Arlington. Um, just had a question about moving the bicycle um, to the exterior of the building. I just have a concern about security. That's a pretty isolated area in the town. Wouldn't want people's bikes to get stripped even if they're locked to something. So just wondering if you could address okay. security. So what we're, what we're anticipating now is, a, uh, is for these to be in a, in a locked in fenced area that, that the fence would go you know, ground all the way up to the other side of the ceiling. So I think some of the discussion about bike bike parking and outside was for day daytime mm -hmm. excuse me, okay. daytime use for yeah, the that was my concern as well. Thank you. Other questions, concerns about this project? Turn it back to the board for any final questions, discussion. <laughs> We've received some updated uh, proposed revised conditions and special conditions from town um, since our last meeting regarding some of the bike parking locations. Uh, one of the conditions that we look for is for final approval of bike parking locations, type of parking, sidewalk materials, uh, exterior material materials, plans and specifications, uh, as far as colors, materials, etc. before building actually issued. Um, <clears throat> a statement from the town engineer that all proposed utility services have adequate capacity to serve the development and that proposed site drainage is adequate. Um, the board maintains continuing jurisdiction over the permit may, after a duly advertised public hearing, attach other conditions or modify these conditions as appropriate. Uh, aside to that, as I alluded to with, with David, any tenant any applicant who wish to open a business as a retail tenant would have to come back in front of us as a, as a matter of course for approval. Any signage would have to be approved either by the Department of Planning or by this board. Uh, snow removal would be the owner's responsibility in accordance with town bylaws. Uh, 
Uh, all exterior trash and storage areas on the property shall be properly screened and maintained in accordance with Article 30 of the Town Bylaws. We've seen that. We discussed that at the last hearing. Uh, trash and recycling will only be picked up on weekdays, normally between the hours of 7 a.m. and 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. Uh, no final permanent, uh, no final or permanent certificate of occupancy shall be issued until the project is completed in its final form and all conditions within this permit have been met. Uh, on the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall file with the building inspector and the Department of Community Safety the names and telephone number of contact persons who may be reached 24 hours each day during the construction period. And then as far as special conditions go, uh, the board will reserve the right that upon installation of any landscaping materials and other site improvements, uh, the applicant owner shall remain responsible for such materials and shall replace and repair as necessary to remain in compliance with the approved site plan. All utility work off-site and public rights of way in the town of Arlington shall be undertaken in accordance with the provisions of the town bylaws. Uh, the applicant shall show evidence of agreement with Zipcar or provide an alternative TDM method uh, prior to mission to build the permit. <coughs> you to seek out alternatives. Can I, can I just comment on, do you want to wait till the end? You can go. We, we only have issues with respect to three and four about some of the wording. Okay. Um, with respect to number three, uh, you know, we discussed, uh, Mr. Watson brought up the issue of some other alternatives, such as giving a credit for bicycle uh, users, a hubway. Um, that could be an alternative at a later date. But we would respectfully suggest prior to the issuance of a final certificate of occupancy, Requiring that before the issuance of a building permit is still pretty far out for us to um, come to terms with Zipcar. So um, I would suggest that change to special condition number three. Thank you. Does make sense? Number four, uh, the applicant shall continuously abide by the transportation demand management plan dated November 17, 2016, which we've been this evening. Uh, keeping with section 8.0183 of the zoning bylaw, applicants shall conduct a survey of residents and commercial employees one month after date of the certificate of occupancy in order to determine a baseline mode split for the project, uh, percentage of resident households and commercial employees using cars, bikes, transit, or walking as their primary road of transportation. The survey, which shall be provided to the Director of Planning and Community Development, will include questions to determine if additional resident households or employees could be using alternatives to having a car on site and impediments, impediments to increasing non-vehicle travel to the site. Uh, one year from the date of the first report and annually thereafter, a similar report based on survey data will be delivered to the Director. If vehicle usage is increased from the baseline report to an extent requiring reconsideration, the owner shall work with the Director to reduce vehicle usage. Reports of the director shall include survey results and the following additional information. A, number of households with one or more cars parked on the site. B, number of households with bikes on the site. C, incentives provided to resident households and or commercial employees by the applicant and actual usage of incentives, i.e. Mean, how many bicycles are usually parked on site, how many transit passes are purchased, and how much subsidy is provided. D, if subsidies are being provided to resident households, how many and of what type. E, what is the usage of the zip car on site. So let me just respond to a couple of things. Um, getting that survey one month, I think, after, I don't think is practical. I would suggest six months for the baseline, and then annually. My client, uh, the housing corporation, has no objection to provide doing that type of survey. As to the commercial, they don't control the commercial employees, so that would be very difficult on their part. Um, and we are committing to there being only one car per household. So um, we're, we're prepared to agree to that now. Um, and also, there's something that we, we also won't be able to know how many people share the the zip, the, the zip car because it could be community residents as opposed to tenants. Right. So and the zip car may not share that information with. They probably won't. Is there a way to track usage of the site, just as far as when it's being used and when it's when it's there and when it's not there? Well, we won't actually be on site. So that would be difficult. You won't that. Um, to get back to the one month question, how soon after CO is issued do you expect to be in full occupancy? For the residential? Yeah. Um, I would say within three months. Okay. I think six months would be fair. Yeah. Thank that. you. Yeah. And we wouldn't have any control in uh, C over the commercial employees. Uh, we could ask the commercial. I think if you would ask them. To do that, this board would keep that condition in mind for any tenants and ask that any 
reopening with a special permit or any conditions placed on them that that be included. Could that be in the lease with the tenants? We, we can put that in the lease. We can certainly put it in the lease. Any further comments on number four? I think that was it. That was it. That was it. Thank you. On five, TDM plan shall include provision that commercial leases require that commercial tenants provide incentives for reduced employee car use. Six, TDM plan shall include in section five, bicycle parking for retail customers. Yeah. Back to the for any discussion or any questions from the applicant. Five and six were fine. This is all. Good. <coughs> I have nothing more on this one. This is kind of a, a big step for us. It's the first project of its kind. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate your patience and your ambition in getting it done. Um, I'm happy to see that you've come back with some of the things that we've asked for. Uh, it's good. I'm excited about it. And I, and I hope it, well, we'll see what happens here. But I'll reserve my comments until after. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'll. Uh, I'll move to approve uh, the special permit with the conditions set forth as amended. Um, the uh, 117 Broadway. Uh, I'm not sure the docket number. Here. Docket number 3520 for 117 Broadway. I'll second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Like I said, I'm excited. I think this is a big step. Thank you very much. We're very excited about it as well. Now, moving on to uh, continuation of public hearing, EDR special permit for Docket 2519, which involves 19R Park Cab. So I'm assuming most of the people in the room are here for tonight. Uh, despite the fact that I did close public comment at the last hearing, I will be reopening that tonight to the changes that you presented to it and giving the community interest in the project. Uh, I will allow you to go over what you've been what's been changed first. Uh, and I would ask anybody in the room to hold any comments until I do open that section of the evening. Before we begin, um, I just want to let the board know that we received attack uh, comments and we're not going to report on traffic tonight because we have referred that back to our traffic consultant so that um, he may um, opine as to the comments made by okay. attack. We do have our views from attack here tonight to answer any questions about the report that they've given in case any members of the board or any members of the public have questions about that. And that is available. That report is available. Um, Where's some copies in the back? There are copies in the back. People haven't seen them. Do we have copies in the back? Yeah, it was yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I think you also have uh, in your packet of the landscaping plan you requested, um, plan showing the redesign of the front building and the architects will speak to that, uh, bicycle storage uh, and the tracks, the shadow plan that was provided, uh, and screen smaller building up front. So I will leave it to Mr. Washington and Mr. Bowman to address the changes. If you'd like to hear that first, I don't know what I'd like to hear the changes first, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, with this uh, this site, our goal was as it was at the last site, and we certainly got lots and lots of comments, and uh, we're pretty confident it led to, to uh, nicer buildings, and I hope you all agree. I will tell you really briefly, I think our, um, I would say we had a consensus that the our original design for the corner building needed a lot of work, and uh, we did do a lot of work on that building. I think it, it is, uh, uh, including looking a lot in the neighborhood and looking for kinds of details that we think would really transfer nicely to this building. As you know, this building does sit in a commercial block as a kind of, in a kind of gateway position into the historic building, or into, uh, into the historic neighborhood. So our goal was to think of it that way, to look into the historic neighborhood, really tap the neighborhood for details that we think really add quality to the buildings, a break down the scale of the buildings, and, and provide uh, uh, more sensitive material 
the materials on the buildings. So we see that where it sits as a kind of trans, it's both a transitional zone because it does have buildings that it relates to right across the street from it. But it also is that gateway. We took that pretty seriously and looked hard at that. The, uh, but so I won't dwell on that. I think I don't want to remind you of bad memories here or anything. <laughs> yeah. the, the other building, I think there were um, comments about it, the scale of the building and how massive it looked, as well as how institutional it looked. And uh, those are also things that we really took to heart. Uh, we changed the materials, as you'll see when Paul starts talking about the new design, we, we uh, really radically changed the materials on the buildings, we changed window types, we added lots of, of uh, visual means of cutting down on the scale of the building, the perceived scale of the building. And uh, we have some uh, views in particular that people were asking, I think they were curious about, particularly views we were crossing <coughs> over the bridge. So we spent a lot more time uh, creating some perspective views so that you would understand it better. Uh, so I think that's essentially what I had to say. I think the, um, uh, we did also, we did do extensive uh, shadow studies so that, uh, that we can better talk about the impact this building has or doesn't have on the existing buildings. And we took that to uh, pretty far uh, to the degree of really studying the landscape, the existing landscape materials that are there. The kinds of so we documented both existing the existing shadow uh, shadows on the site and then the proposed shadows that would result from our new development. So we uh, we really tried to listen, and we got open ears uh, for more listening. So I'll walk you through the details. So starting out on our, our building on the corner, we uh, we made a number of uh, significant changes to this. We uh, one of the first ones is we just brought in the massing of these corner elements so that they didn't dominate over the top of, of this and so smoothed out that edge so it wasn't we didn't have like these larger blocks. We also toned in this this cornice and also made it more continuous. That kind of gave it more of a continuous residential feel to these uh, to these things. At the same time, we were also thinking about the references back into the, you know, we're coming from Park Avenue, uh, from Park Street, I should say, from Mass Avenue. And so in terms of brick color, we were thinking about picking up on some of the, the, the materials that we have uh, from the adjacent buildings, Arlington Coal and Lumber, and our, and our neighbors directly nearby, in order to have that be more of a part of, of the neighborhood. Another, uh, as Cliff was saying, one of the other things we were looking at in terms of the uh, in terms of the look of the building, in you know, we made, we were going around looking at the uh, you know some of the neighborhoods in Crescent Hill, Westminster, Montague Street, uh, just looking at how siding works, how trim works around windows, you know, uh, picking up a few of these details and uh, and bringing them over in, in the senses of cornices and so on. Um, one of the things we considered, and I, you know, because I'm sure some people will, will bring it up, is, is, is gables and whether we should be having gables and all this, because a lot of these buildings do have them. I mean, the, we we did consider that. We were thinking about it, but our our concerns were twofold. One is that if we were to gable up on top of this, it sort of made it more massive. If we kept the same footprints in here. On the other hand, if we were to go the opposite way and do a top floor, which is you know doing something like this, or like you know as, as one sees elsewhere in the in the true uh, single-family houses in the neighborhood, that sort of you know it seriously limits what you can do with that top floor, and, and we we felt that was not really something that we could justifiably do in terms of uh, cutting down the number, the amount of, of area we needed for uh, residential space. So. Um, <clears throat> So that's our view from uh, from across down square. This is the view coming from Park Avenue. We're showing a mechanical screen here up at the top of the building, um, and so it, it, we're using similar materials to that, and uh, we're, it, it really doesn't dominate the overall size of it, but it, it 
does it does show up. You can't you can't see it at that point. Um, we also did another view looking around the corner, and this is so this is looking across from Lowell Street across the street, and you know this is a bit of a panorama view because we're it's we're close to us. This is our next door neighbor here on Lowell Street, but. Uh, one thing we did want to do here is to, is to add another element that does bring it up a little bit on this side where it's a little more screened by trees, but also this is sort of forming the, the transition into the other buildings that we have on the side out the rear. Um, one thing we, we did want to do as we were moving along is to have the same kind of language, uh, visual language and detailed language in this building as we start to do on the larger uh, building on the, uh, on the rest of the site, and on the bikeway. So in elevations, you know, we, we do have a little bit of a screen there. As I said, we did bring down the, the cornices on the Park Street elevation, but we did pop up a little bit. This is, this is where our stair happens on the outside, so it's not the, the residential part of that building. But um, <coughs> more elevation here. Elevation. So yes, this is the this is the elevation along Park Street. So we're again trying to have a rhythm where we have one set of windows here, and then two, and then one, and then two, and that way it's it's not just a repetitive uh, series of windows going straight across. Uh, so moving on to the, our, our larger building. Um, facing the bike path. We felt it was really important to study its relationship to that bike path. There was a fair number of questions about how the ramp would work in. And, and I, so there's, there's some fairly good sized trees that would be staying that are, um, that are right coming off the corner of our, of our neighbors who are the, uh, the Sitco station. So this, this is trees that would essentially still be there. Um, but we really like the idea of being able to open that up and, and have the building be something that, you know, still, it still has a lot of foliage around, on, around it. Um, so this is a similar view that to what we had had before. Um, we still have this, the, the darker panels here. Again, we're trying to work with the, uh, the Getting some uh, some passive and or, or active solar, uh, some solar thermal um, influences here at the, at the rear. Basically, doing a collector on the south side, which would only be on the south side, I mean, those metal panels. Um, but again, we were looking to lighten up the color palette, do the detailing differently. We were bringing down the cornices and several other areas just to lessen the overall uh, impact. And again, um, changing the material colors, changing brick, changing trim style. Uh, so this, this we're imagining this is being fiber cement panels at the top level using fiber cement siding that would then run down at, that, at, the, uh, at these other parts in order to tone that all down. Again, this is a, this is a larger building that we still wanted to use similar visual language to what we were using at this building. And I think this really ties those two together yeah, fairly successfully. Um, why don't we move on to questions that we had about, uh, about shadows. So we did a, ser a series of shadow studies, and I don't know if you all can see them from that far back, but we did shadows in two colors on these. So existing shadows are in gray. Our building casts blue shadows in this study just for for reference, so you can see this is, uh, this is summer solstice okay in June. Um, so at 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and 6 p.m. So from 9 a.m. to through the middle of the day and at 3 p.m., there's really very little shadow cast amongst any of the neighbors' uh, uh, buildings, really not even out of the parking lot. At 6 p.m., of course, the shadows lengthen. They do move across, but they're moving across the bike path and not come across towards the uh towards the other buildings. Those are uh, uh, 
So in these, we also did indicate, you know, trees casting shadows. Uh, so at 9 a.m., we are casting a bit of a shadow out, to, out into here. Um, by noon, it casts a shadow about to the base of the buildings uh, across the parking lot on the Lowell Street, but not blocking midday sun. By 3 p.m., the shadows lengthen probably about to, about to here. So upper stories of those buildings, you can probably be seeing some side of um, possibly much lower. And of course, 6 p.m. doesn't make any difference anymore. Um, what time of the year was that? I'm sorry? What time of the year was that? So this is this is winter solstice. So, so December. So yeah, December, December 21st. Right. Yeah. About a month from now. Right. Um, we also did include with this a uh, an updated uh, landscape plan indicating trees, indicating planting going along our, our edge, uh, buffering between our parking lot and the neighbors were are going to be uh, having a uh, solid fence. Actually, there are solid fences. The neighbors have solid fences for the most part along there now. Um, so, and that's about it. So. And I'd just like to point out a couple of things. I walked down the bike path this weekend, and um, thinking about the complaints about it being a large development and being height and mass. Um, and actually, the Sunrise Assisted Living, which is a block to the west, is four stories and much larger than what our building will be. And on the east is the Watermill Condominiums, which is actually five stories over a parking garage. So, um, and, and many more units than what we're proposing. So it's not out of context with what's in the neighborhood, actually. Um, and also, if you look at the corner building, and there was one that you, sh you uh, see you were showing, but up Lowell, um, our corner building really is about the same height as its closest neighbor. Yeah, so, um Right, so there were a, a number of questions about height at the, uh, at the last uh, hearing. And, well, and before I forget about it again, since we talked about it so much in the last one, we are including showing in, indoor bike storage here on the first floor. Uh, we'd have a door from the outside, so it solves the, door, the muddy tire through the hallway problem. Um, so we are anticipating including that. Then we had showed that as a mechanical space, but not further reflection on it, it as much. But we're um, talking about the height of buildings. Right, right, right. So I just wanted to say that before I say that. Um, so height of buildings. So our, you know, we, we had surveys that indicate, uh, you know, so the height of our building from from ground level to top of roof, that would be 30 feet plus about another 18 to 24 inches for the cornice. Uh, the zoning itself refers to the, the height to top of roof. Um, Neighboring buildings, of course, you know, they, while they do have uh, peak roofs, according to um, what we received from, from the survey, the, the peaks of those roofs are generally about 32 feet or so above the, uh, above the level of the curb. So, you know, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the ballpark, as it were, like, in terms of the overall, uh, overall height. And actually, um, if you go down Lowell, there are at least 10 to 11 buildings that have full three stories, you know, maybe peak roof, but full windows. So they're full three-story buildings, and most of them are single-family houses, actually. As far as the height, the, the height of the, the larger building, so that that one, you know, we're thirty feet to the roof. It's, it's not an issue. The uh, the height of the over the our, our larger building, um, you know, the allowed height according to the bylaw refers to the distance. The height is defined as the distance from the average of the elevations at the curve to the top of the roof. So we took all of the elevations at the curve, we averaged them all together, and that came to I believe, 154 and change. Um, Add to that 40 feet, and because the site is basically higher here than the height that we're doing our building at here, we're essentially, at least from, from ground level to the top of the roof, we're about three feet under. The, uh, the uh, what's in the zoning bylaw for, for, for maximum height. So we, we did we did 
a little bit of research and a little bit of math in order to make sure that we were well within the requirements there. There have also been a question whether the building could really be shifted you know, a little bit closer to this side and a little further away from there, but there's, you know, we have the same uh, side, side lot line requirement here as we do over here at 20 feet. So even though the back of that is a gas station and these are houses, you know, without, without relief, we wouldn't be able to make any you know, of that kind of change, which we're not looking for. Um, so uh, as far as rooftop mechanicals, similar to what we were talking about on the other buildings, we created a few um, a few areas that would be screened basically over each section block of building. We would have a screen around our mechanicals for those sections. Um, as you as you probably have noticed from the uh, you know, from our perspectives, these aren't screens that one typically sees because they're we keep them pulled back far enough from the. Uh, Catch a somewhat glimpse of them as you're as you're on the outside of it, um, and uh, traffic management. I'm sure we'll discuss that. Um, mm -hmm. and any questions on what we got changed here? Uh, so I definitely can appreciate the. Scaling back a bit of the, of the front building, um, you, you know, this is the first time to take a look at it. Uh, I, guess, I guess one thing I'll say is, is um, I, I don't know, I never go in this direction, but my first impression is, is oh, I, I kind of like the green. <laughs> I kind of like the way it was to some extent. <laughs> I mean, another tan building with a brick, ba you know, brick basement, it's kind of like that. Um, and and I, I wonder whether, the scaling of it really depends on that type of thing. I mean, in the end, because I do find it a little of a mishmash on the other building. You got brick, and you got the other thing. It just so um, anyway on the larger building. on the larger building. I, I don't okay. quite get that one. Um, but uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. I don't have too much. I guess I, I guess um, I think it does harken a little bit back to the old three uh, three family. Uh, type of thing, which I think is what you're trying to do. Um, anything you can do to even make it maybe even a little bit more like that, like playing around with the curving the one of the walls or something like you do on a three-family sometime, um, you may want to consider. There's certainly uh, quite a few of those, uh, certainly in East Darlington as well. Um, just a thought. But I do think it's the right direction as far as getting rid of that, you know, kind of big blocky uh, Type nature, so um, I, I don't have a huge amount otherwise, just because it's kind of new. So uh, and I haven't put my thoughts together too well. But, so I'll pass it over. Maybe I'll think of something more eloquent. Well, everyone else talks. Thank you. Um, well, let me st start with. Um, I like where, the way it's heading. You guys did. You, you guys did a lot to address those comments we had earlier. I'm going to give you a few more. Okay. <laughs> um, Let's start with the driveway right now. What is the slope of that driveway? It's pretty. It's it's almost like um, from the from the street to let's say where the bottom of that curve is. It's almost what twelve feet. Oh yeah, yeah. no no. Um, there, there's a, a good deal of that height change is really behind the building. Yeah, behind. Okay. You know, going down from the rear of the building to the bike. I mean, okay, so how how steep ramp is to go to? How so, steep is that ramp then? Um, essentially, well, I mean, our our elevation of our building, we're anticipating it being around 151. This is the is the, the target we're shooting for in terms of elevation. The height at the curb on the outside here is about <coughs> 154. So. Essentially, and there's a little bit of up and down as it goes around here, but essentially it's a three foot difference from here all the way to out here. And in terms of how much of a gradient that is, it's well, we've, com we've committed to making that an accessible path. Sure. From, the, from Lowell Street all the way across. And the only time we were actually thinking we need a ramp may be on the, to get down to the bridge, the transition. Okay, from so the that slope on that driveway is. 
uh, equivalent to a handicap ramp. Yeah, I mean, it's so basically, you, yeah, I mean, well, not yeah. even the ramp, actually, it's slow. Slow. Uh, yeah, I'm so just trying to get, do we need railings there? And, and, and as the cars come up, are they going to mm -hmm. need some sort of transition strip before you get to the, so, so, yeah. so. Yeah, you know, we, we haven't done all the actual grading of it, but it doesn't look like it would really need it. I mean, we've got the existing contour line okay. at this point here is 151, it, and, you know, you, work your way up along up there. It's actually steepest here. We might be trying to smooth that out so that we, we have a smoother transition. But yeah. I apologize because I done I was, the engineering yeah, great. Right. I was on the, the bike path. No, uh, I mean you're, the you're, you're correct that the bike path is a good deal lower, but that's what this ramp is negotiating. That's fine. Yeah. I just I just saw from the bike path and no. where the street was and I just yeah. I just Are, made that you know I uh, no you're you're absolutely right. And the, the goal is well it's not a goal. We're confident we can create an accessible path that is really important to the public benefit for this development. And as I said, we the limitations are only at the very end and there we would have a ramp that probably would be steep enough to require railing, so it'd be greater than five oh, percent. Okay. And then uh, I'll go back, like I said before, you don't have an idea where the transformer is going to go here. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I, I know, yeah, it's, always, it's, yeah. al it's always something yeah. that comes up. It's always a big kind of. I mean, right now, I would I would be thinking right here would be the obvious place to do. We've got some power poles right out, right the so closest directly directly across. It's the closest. It's not in the way of okay. other things. That that's where we would. And start shooting for it. And actually, I think the town has a transformer looking box there. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, there, there's, 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 there's some right there. there I think the light yeah. bulbs yeah. to be Okay, and then with this complex, I know it's the larger building. Is there enough water pressure so you don't need a, a fire pump or a jockey pump? We haven't done a, a, a hydrant flow test yet. We're a ways away from that. I think uh, usually the um, the, the solution to do that, if the, if the pressure is low, the fire pump goes into the building. Do you know if other surrounding buildings, you mentioned some of the, the taller buildings there, do they have provisions no, for I haven't actually asked them. I've not heard that there's a problem at all, but. I, I just, I'm just. We could certainly look into it. I'm just saying, when, once you go across that threshold yeah. with a, with we a would, fire we pump. would certainly be required to. For then check that uh, out. Now you're talking so generator so and all the other stuff, and it's all that's. All the other oh, stuff that comes with it, and it just yeah, makes the right. whole thing a lot more complicated than. Certainly, and those are those are all yeah. important bridges that will will be crossed. Our okay. engineers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A lot of engineering. Both, will come. both buildings will be fully sprinkled. Yes, I realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're just okay. Um, and then I'm assuming trash is all internal. On the big building, on the small on the smaller building, it's going to be outside by the parking. Yeah, we have a yeah, parking area here at the here at the, you the trend, fence. You got a potential corner behind this uh, transformer parking, okay. <laughs> and then um, yeah, and then and then um, trash. And then where the parking lot um, fronts to the neighbors, you show a bunch of um, shrubs there, right? Right. Yes, we showed a uh, trees, really. strip of strip of planting running along all of that. Is there fencing there too, or just shrubs? Yeah, we, we're showing a six-foot board fence going all the okay. way along. Okay. Yeah. So headlights don't get into the neighbors or right. none of that stuff right. there. Okay. And they're going to be trees as opposed to just shrubs. They're going to be trees and shrubs. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mixture. Yeah, I think it's got to call out. There's some linden trees in there. Yeah, there's some substantial. We, we've got a five-foot-wide buffer there. Yeah. 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 Lots of space. And then uh, I like the fact that what you guys do, the scale, trying to break down some of the scale and, and transitions. I, I, I still have a little more issue with the bigger building at the corners where you have those um, the corner units with the big um, aluminum storefront windows. That still somehow seems to me a little bit. No, let's go to the other side on the bike side. Bike half side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that still seems kind of out of scale, what's there. I know it's facing the bike path, it's facing toward oh, a mess. Yeah. <laughs> it's facing the cold yeah. rubber yard, actually. Uh, but that's the side, I, I just feel that's still a little, I well, mean, 
that's a living room. That's going to give you. That's right. Well, the genesis of that is going uh, back to our net zero goal or near net zero goal. So, the the windows as designed now have integral sun shade into the windows, and we made really big windows in the living rooms, hoping to even have uh, some passive collection on the inside of the living room. So, a dark color, probably a uh, you know inch and a half of concrete, dark color. We're, that's why we did it that way. It was lots of southern collection on, on that side with shading. So, you know, so during the summer, we're, we're actually shading the free silhouette. And actually, you can't, people, anyone on Mass Ave could not look across and see into those units. Well, there's a, they, there's a, the coal and lumber yard that's there, uh, and it's uh, actually very well. You, 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 don't, yeah. you can't see the bike path from there. Maybe I'm in a minority here. Okay. It seems like my, uh, my other partner, they, they, they don't seem to mind it. I just I've seen too many of just the box in the I, I, I just would just um, suggest maybe uh, instead of more of a horizontal kind of mullion, more of a vertical mullion, uh, where it leads more, I realize that, <laughs> but it, it, it leads more toward residential, you know. It just doesn't seem as industrial to me. That's my opinion, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> I'm done. David. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the height, particularly the, the larger building. If I recall correctly, um, at the uh, last hearing on the Broadway site, you had showed uh, kind of a an, an elevation comparing all the neighboring structures. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you have something like that for for the Down and Square mm -hmm. site? It's so the only thing we can really see in these is a a two twelve. Yeah, I mean, it's really kind of difficult because our our buildings are right directly next to the neighboring building, and those you know there's the grade change from front to back of the site as well. So, yeah. I, I mean we. We did we did some studies where you know it's you know we, we do know that if you're standing here on Lowell Street you're you know basically about this high on the large belt you know this <laughs> this this elevation does not show our new building here I just realized yeah. because we were really thinking about how this one worked in the corner but uh, our our new building going across here would be you know right around you know that high. Um, going across yeah, the back. So it would literally be three feet lower, isn't that yeah, what you said uh, earlier? Yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't be towering over. Actually, this is. It would actually be below. The, 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 so the reason we didn't do that street elevation is we're not making a street right. with that building. It's set you know, uh, quite a ways off of the neighboring building. So we do they do a site section where you can, I don't know if you can all see that, but. So this is our proposed building. Remember the grades going down. So there's our proposed building, and actually the, the top of the Lowell Street buildings is you know, virtually the same. The height of it is virtually the same. We did these studies it, kind of in conjunction with the um, with the shadow studies mm -hmm. because uh, solar impact is usually measured two ways. One is direct shadow impact, which is why we pulled the building so close to the to the bike path, yeah. but the others view with the open sky, and that's what we wanted to study with the building section. And uh, we think that you, you know this demonstrates pretty well that actually view of the open sky has uh, changed almost none actually, uh, particularly with the amount of landscape that does, exists and that we're proposing. Does that show the relationship between? Um, your building and the existing structures just to the west? Low place, I think that's the top. Yes, yeah, so this is another section. So this is this is the other section. And, uh, so this section here is cut um, From, on the, as if you're on on the site plan through this building here. Okay, so kind of like through that building and through ours, okay? okay. The other, this section here, mm -hmm. It's cut the long way there. Okay, so we're seeing the profile of that, and then that's you know our building here. These are the trees that are you know right along the fence line on the property line between.
between us and, uh, and, the, and the Lowell Street place folks. So you're trying to, yeah, on Lowell Street, they're looking at the end elevation of the building. So they're yeah. looking at the narrower end, even though you see that in elevation, that's not what you see. Yeah, they're not they're seeing this, yes, they're seeing this elevation here, which is... Actually, I think you meant low place. Yes, low place. You're right, yes. yes. But uh, anyway, that's how we did that. It, it's you know, it's different talking about height with this building than it is when you're really yeah. tying into the streets. No, that that's helpful. I mean, I did take a look at, at the site and was having a little bit of trouble visualizing the relationship between the proposed building and it's and really hard because the terrain is is uneven and, and what you see isn't exactly what finished grade would be anyway. So we you know, we've had to do it from the you know civil civil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I did. I when I was out there, it was actually early in the morning, and uh -huh. um, and and so I was looking at, at the shadows, and you know, look looking at at the shadow um, study uh, for for the winter in the morning, uh, I am a little concerned about about the uh, the buildings. Um, to the to the kind of west northwest, yeah. And I'm not. How does that? How does what we're seeing there relate to uh, the light that those structures get now without without your building there? Well, right now there's a lot of vegetation there, and there's going to be a lot of vegetation post uh, post project as well. So I think that's. That's why we, we looked at trees, heights of trees, density with and without leaves to study exactly that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, there's no question. And remember, these are this is the worst case that you see as far as that morning shadow. This is as bad as it gets any time of year, December 21st. So it's, from that point on, it gets better uh, in both directions. Right up until June, when, they, when there's minimal impact, middle of June. Um, did we did we want to talk about the, uh, the traffic study and, and the transportation committee's report, or are we deferring that? I think we probably will defer that proceeding. But you can certainly ask any questions. We do have our views here from the transportation advisory committee. Um, yeah, because I, I th sorry. I was wondering if you would like to have him run through the memo that he. Oh, that so yeah, that that, that would be helpful. Yeah, I think that yeah. would be helpful. Yeah. Um, my name is Howard Muse. I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, we formed a working group of four people uh, to review the traffic study and uh, provide you with some comments on it. Uh, our major comment actually has to do with the fact that it's a traffic impact study and really doesn't address anything but traffic. Uh, and from the site plan and the TDM program and so forth, there seems to be a lot of other things going on in transportation that we think should be included in instead of calling it a traffic impact study, maybe transportation study. Uh, such as the proximity to the bike path and the ramp down to the bike path. Uh, the bike path has, uh, has a set of stairs up to Park Ave. So residents of the development could go down to the bike path and up to Park, uh, park Ave to get to the bus stops in uh, the Heights. Uh, so it, a number of our comments are suggesting that the information like that be included in the study. Uh, in terms of the traffic impact study itself, generally we felt it followed accepted methodology. Uh, and uh, in, in one regard, we felt it may overstate the number of vehicles that would be coming in and out of the site because it did not take any credit for the fact that there would be transit use or bike use, that sort of thing. Uh, what's called trip generation rates that were used uh, are from a national source that uh, usually has very little transit use. So uh, again, there may actually be fewer trips than they're projecting. 
<coughs> One question we had is they do have a dis trip distribution for the project, which on the face of it looks uh, reasonable, but they didn't cite any source for it or how they developed it. Tip trip distribution is looking at the percentage of vehicles that go on various roadways approaching the next city site. Um, one of our, uh, sort of another major concern is the analysis of the operation of the proposed driveway on Lowell Street. Uh, it does a level of service analysis which shows no problem with it. However, that level of service analysis, as best we can tell, does not take into account the queuing on Lowell Street of eastbound traffic approaching Downing Square. Uh, the driveway appears to be only about 65 feet from the stop park at Downing Square. So uh, if there's any extensive queuing at all, which I believe happens both in the evening and the morning, probably more so in the morning, uh, it would be very easy for the queue to uh, queue, for the cars to queue past the driveway, blocking people trying to get out, but more importantly, blocking cars that may be turning left into it have just come out of Downing Square. Uh, if the car gets stopped there, then the cars behind you could get stopped, and you wouldn't have to have very many cars queued up before they might go into Downing Square. Uh, there's no discussion of that or analysis of that in the study, so I think that's something that we should take a look at. Uh, we do. We recognize that this a transportation demand management program is being developed. We think it should be included in the transportation study. Um, there's some confusion over the number of parking spaces. Uh, it appears that there is uh, 20, it, the report says there's 27 spaces. The site plan that we have had a note on it that said 23 spaces. We only counted 20 spaces. Um, so it would be important to make sure that we get that final number right. correct. The other comment we would make is it would be nice to have some documentation that whatever number you end up for the number of spaces is adequate for both the residents and any visitors because there's not very much on street parking around the site. Uh, and all of it would require people to go, basically go in from the Lowell Street driveway down to the major building. So it's not very convenient to be on street parking. Um, <coughs> We thought because of the location of, uh, I think there's about three bus lines that go through uh, Mass Ave and uh, Park Ave. Uh, we thought it would be good for the study to document the number of lines, uh, how frequent the bus service is, um, this sort of information uh, as a way of getting some feel for how effective uh, transit use could be for the residents. Uh, the plan also indicates outdoor parking for bicycles. You discussed that a little bit more uh, tonight. Um, and the connection to the Minuteman bikeway, none of that is discussed in the transportation study. And again, we think the appropriate place to outline all of that information. Uh, again, I mentioned the potential connection to the bikeway by pedestrians. Uh, there's uh, a set of stairs, a very long set of stairs uh, going from the bikeway up to Park Ave. But you could also, if you were on a bike or walking, you could go through the Gold Street parking lot, which is uh, would have much less of a climb involved in it. Uh, and finally, we did uh, raise a question about the um, maximum grade on the site driveway, which you discussed this evening. The other one was, um, it was not too clear to us about uh, access for fire trucks and emergency vehicles, how they get, not so much how they get down into the site, but how they would get back out of the site. Uh, and I don't know whether you've met the <coughs> fire department yet or not, we but have. obviously they have to approve what they do. They do have that. So just to be clear about the number of parking spaces, you're not the first one. Is, uh, there's 20 spaces across here. We also have three handicapped spaces here, here, here. So that's how we got to the total number of 23. I don't know where the 27 is. 23 is the number. And I have two 
comment questions. One, and I'm, you know, I'm the architect, I'm not the traffic engineer, so I'm actually asking this to help give some uh, more information for the traffic study. Is uh, the queuing during, um, during peak periods, is that both morning and evening that queues pass the, the, uh, yes. the I believe it is. Yes. Yes. It is. Yes. Okay. It is. Okay. Well, Lowell Street, just said one minute. Lowell Street has a uh, fairly heavy amount of traffic, so and it all has to stop at that and square at the stop sign, so it's very easy for it to queue back, and it very okay. strongly affects every other road. Okay. Well, it it is, down. I mean, I'm not expressing an opinion. That was a question right. on, uh, to the engineer, and then uh, we sort of answered this already. We did need the fire department yes. fact, it was. Uh, I call it the fire chief's suggestion about having that turnaround in our right of way. We have that right of way that cuts through. Uh, uh, we, we, we thought that it would be kind of a disaster to propose a driveway out <coughs> of the park. Um, but we can use it. We are guaranteed by deed to have access, free access to that right of way, which we would use as a turnaround. Well, we did ask the question about whether we could put in a second driveway yeah. to alleviate the problem of the left turn vehicles coming in off of Lowell Street or traffic exiting on the Lowell Street and going through Downing Square. If you could have a driveway going out on the Park Ave and then going right. It would have to be right turn only, though. Right, I think because you're, it's still sloped. It, I don't think you'd be able to see over the bridge. But yeah, I'm not a traffic engineer. Well, but that well, would, if we look at it, I think it would probably end up right turn over. Park Ave in the evening would be a disaster if people were turning off of Park Ave into a driveway. Um, I think it would then back all the way up to Route 2. Yeah, right turn, I wouldn't be able to turn a lot of there. It would be only from the park. park. It's a main yeah. driveway from Park Ave. Yeah. We could do one way both ways. Yeah, but it'd be right turn only, but that would be really good. have a right turn in and a right turn out. But anyway, our, our suggestion was that you look at or document. Um, we didn't know about the engineering feasibility of the driveway and also the traffic impact. Take a look at that uh, included in the report. I think just, just a clarification to everyone here that the proponent did indicate to us that they've seen this, they've taken it to their mm -hmm. traffic mm -hmm. engineer. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the way it's very obvious that we'll be continuing this hearing to our next hearing next time. And I hope some of those questions will be answered at that point. I know we're going to have a lot of questions. Okay, so well, David, do you have anything else? Yeah, I, uh, again, uh, the, my, the site visit uh, was at about 8 o'clock in the morning, and, uh, and we did observe uh, queuing on Lowell Street uh, eastbound uh, that did extend past uh, where the driveway would be located. Uh, and that was really the only leg of the intersection where uh, we saw that kind of, that kind of queuing. Uh, so I, I think just, just to emphasize that that, that is a concern, as, as Mr. Muse pointed out, and I'd be very interested in, in seeing an analysis of whether uh, we could, uh, whether to, uh, adding another, potentially adding another driveway on Park Street, uh, potentially with the right turn restriction um, uh, or thinking about the circulation in and out of the site to avoid the uh, to avoid that backup on Wall Street I, I think would be, uh, would be good to see so I look forward to seeing that um, I'd also point out that uh, giving um, uh, bicyclists a way to get out of the site um, and out to Mass Ave um, uh, without going out to Wall Street and navigating the Downing Square intersection uh, could be advantageous. Um, and I, I wanted to, to say we, I, I like the look of the, of the, uh, the bridge and the, the connection down to the bike path. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking uh, also as, as the TAP noted that uh, that's I think worthy of including in the TDM plan uh, because I think that's a bike connection that there'd be an accessible <coughs> path there. Um, uh, so I, I'd like to add that. <coughs> um, and let's see, do I have any other questions? Um, the one comment I would make about the bikes is the, uh, yeah. the bike certainly could use that right away. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, bike. Yeah. It's paved. 
Uh, I was, when I was standing there on the bike path, um, I was, again, having trouble visualizing what it was going to look like and concerned about how massive it was going to feel um, from the perspective of someone on the bike path. And, you know, seeing, seeing this really helps me understand it, that, you know, it seems like there's uh, considerably more uh, setback from the bike path than, than there is with some of the existing structures along the bike path. Um, and, uh, and so I think my, my concern from that perspective was, was alleviated by, by seeing this view of it. Thank you, Howard. I really like the opening up of the bike path. My question there is, uh, what sort of lighting, if any, do you propose for yeah. that section? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. As, as you know, anybody who's ridden, ridden the dot bike path, you know, after dusk, it's a very dark. Black. Very dark. Very, very, dark. Uh, very dark. Can be very dangerous. No uh, uh, and I, you know, and it, and it sort of runs right into the question of being dark sky compliant. You know, in which we're obligated to not have light falling outside of you know of the property line. You know, the pro our property line is not on the bike path. So, what do we do with that? I mean, we, you know, and I think you know certainly we could. There's there's plenty we could do to have lighting, and we would absolutely do uh, plenty of lighting up and down a ramp, so that you know have uh, either lit handrails or um, or little. Uh, Many sconces in the side in the retaining walls of the ramp, which would which would provide plenty of illumination in there. And on our site, the illumination of the bike path itself is it's a, it's a, I think a bigger question. Yeah, you know I, I think we would be picking up some diffuse lighting for whatever we had going on in our in our in our backyards for our own for the security of the site. But um, you know it, it's really. You know, I think it's really difficult to make commitments about how, you know, how this would be illuminated any more than the rest of the many miles of bike path, you know, on and um, that's a great and bigger question, and to me, at least. We're actually willing to talk to Arlington Cola um, about what they're going to do on their side in terms of lighting at night. There isn't much over there either. Um, they're also have been approached about doing a ramp from their parking lot down to the bike path. Um, some people tell me they've agreed to it. I've not heard that from them. <laughs> and does this provide public access from the bike way all the way through to, to Little Street? Yes, yes. Right we're, right not, right? We're, yes. Not, we're not showing any you know, gates or you know, restriction of that, of that uh, route through. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then getting back to, we get away from the design a little bit, but I actually like the, the larger building for the most part. I think it's, the, the height concerns me. Uh, it doesn't do anything else. But I, I think I'm more concerned with that front corner on Wall Street of that building there. I, I know that's the old uh, one that you have there. I, I'm still not, uh, I'm not satisfied with, with the mass of it. I think it still seems almost monolithic. It's, it's still a, a fairly institutional, hard, right angle design um, that I don't think is necessarily particularly welcoming to, to that neighborhood. Um, and I'm not sure how that impacts the view from around the corner there as well. Um, I don't know if there's anything you could do to soften that top corner, bring that down. Um, but I, I think I'd like to see some other option there in the flat roof box. Rounding the corner. We, we heard last time there was some talk of softening these edges and rounding them off and I'm still not seeing that it fits. It still seems like a, a large box dropped on the corner of this neighborhood where you've got single family houses with some yards, some green space. Um, I'd like to see some change as well. But I think it may be that consistent with the, the comment about pushing the triple decker piece a little bit more, which might include adding bays to it to, to make it less fun. So I think that could help. And certainly yeah. something we can do. Also, I think, yeah, I mean, particularly along this 
the yeah, face right. of it actually. Yeah, exactly. this, this actually breaks up a fair amount a lot here, but yeah. I think that's the one you're reacting to. And maybe, maybe, it's the, maybe it's the drawing that's, that's throwing me. It, it doesn't look quite so bad if you look at the, the drawing too forward. You see building entrance from Wall Street. There it seems a little more suitable, uh, and a little less. There's just a blocked off corner here, but if there was some some openings, some glass, alternate entrance, you don't have regular access, it might lend to a feel of uh, being a little bit more welcoming to that part. It opened up to the uh, buildings on the other side of the as well. Yeah. Anybody else have Right, I'm going to open it up to the folks in the crowd. Uh, Appreciate you all coming and waiting. Uh, I want to call on you. Raise your hand. Uh, name and address, please. Address the board. We'll direct your questions either to the applicant or their architect or, or TAC. Uh, please. Yes, sir. Um, Don Mills, uh, 33 Bow Street. Uh, regarding your comment about the massing of the corner building, the, uh, the main part I have a hard time with is the approach when you're coming over the bridge on the bike path. And you have these very small windows that look like bathroom windows that are your introduction to the building as you're heading north. That is the next sheet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, 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 yeah, it looks very unwelcoming and strange. I don't think your plan showed those to be bathrooms. I think those are bathrooms. Do we have any windows in the bathroom? But also, I mean, it, it, and it conflicts greatly with your effort to get solar gain in the large building with large glass facing south. This is facing <coughs> south. Yeah and it's the smallest windows that are on there. I also wondered if you ever considered mansards with dormers for this third floor. We did. Not we that you want to use the Peter Pan suppression for your, for your uh, <laughs> reference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know if it would work with that, but uh, it would be a potential to soften. Yeah. Maybe yeah. even if it's just at the corner. The other comment or question I had was regarding funds for maintenance. Um, we live next door, and we, we live in a single family home next to a two family that was bought uh, maybe a decade ago by the Arlington Housing Corp. And the difference in maintenance from when it was privately owned to when it was owned by the corporation has been significant in terms of the exterior. With a condominium association, there's a guarantee that you have funds uh, through a condo association fee. But I don't know if there's anything like that for this multifamily housing in terms of maintaining the building over time, deferred maintenance, uh, things of that sort. That's a great question. Can you answer that? Sure. Um, well, this will have 34 units that will be spinning off a uh, decent cash flow. And so we don't anticipate maintenance on an ongoing basis being a problem. The trouble with a two-family is there's very little cash flow, very tight. Um, and so it is more difficult to spend money on maintenance, although I think we've done a significant amount of work actually on that building next to you uh, in the last couple of years and um, they are up for painting next year so as well as the one further down on Bull Street. Right. Uh, Lisa Hines, 14 Sunset Road. Um, I wanted to offer my support for the project. I think that this will be a good amenity for Arlington and increased density. Um, but I, I do have some concerns, one of which um, is about the mechanical screen on the top floor. Thank you for addressing that. Um, I'm wondering if there are any acoustical provisions, including mufflers or sound attenuators, or whether it's strictly an aesthetic screen. I also have a question about um, the larger building being located in the flood zone. I don't know if that's within the um, purview of the redevelopment board, but um, I would be glad to hear comment on that and what provisions might be put on the burden on the part of the town uh, for infrastructural changes as a result of uh, ongoing climate change and uh, flooding over time or what the project is going to implement. Um, my last concern that I would be glad to hear addressed is about the dumpster location. Uh, near the private way, which also seems to be where a possible transformer might be. Um, it appears as though it could be blocked by a parked vehicle 
uh, want to be accessible um, spots. So I don't understand the provisions for um, trash removal um, if that is the dumpster location. And I wonder if the architects would consider alternative things. But in closing, I do want to reemphasize my support for the project um, and that I think it is an asset to our community. I can start by answering some. Yeah. Well, I can start. Why don't I start by talking about the dumpsters that would be on the side? They would be carts, first of all, for the six units. And our maintenance men take them out and um, take them to the sidewalk, basically, the day that the uh, will be picked, the garbage will be picked up. So that's not an issue. As far as its location relative to that space, it, it, it would essentially use the access aisle for that handicap space, not the space itself. So the car doesn't block the uh, space because it can just use the access aisle of the, of the handicap space. Um, yeah, well, the other one, the, the screening? Yeah, yes, acoustical. acoustical. And what, I mean, there are state guidelines for, um, you know, DP level of property lines, and we would meet or exceed those, which could very well mean having to add some acoustical absorption at the screening. We would totally do that, just, uh, that's a very common uh, complaint of neighbors, and we, we don't want to be there. So that is uh, uh, taken into account. Your comment about resiliency, that uh, in this building, we had the bigger building in particular, we have the option of second floor uh, mechanical room, which would be at the very minimum, uh, you know, a step towards resiliency. The building is going to be designed with a flow through foundation as well. So we're, we'll be well above the flood level and we'll have a flow through foundation and we'll get our mechanical equipment upstairs. So the resiliency plan. Um, is that right? is that um, I so. think that covered uh, the things I brought to you. And I'll just say that the project will need to go in front of the Conservation Commission for a hearing because of its distance from the mill road. So, but that is a separate process. And we're crossing it. So our amenity that we're proposing in connection to the bike path, we have to bridge across that stream, so that's going to need some careful review. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Laura Desmond. I live on Wall Street Place. I'm also here representing a number of my neighbors who were not able to be here tonight. Um, thank you to the board for actually hearing what the neighbors on Wall Street Place have been worried about in terms of the height of the building. Um, if there is any way to cut down the end height on that, we'd be very grateful. Um, it's going to severely impact the houses that abut right there. And uh, there are people with families with kids that like to play out in the yard, and they'd like to actually have some sunshine back there once in a while. Um, one question that we do have for the Housing Corporation, given that uh, the bike path um, access looks great, um, one problem that we have in Mole Street Place is we do get to use the word, vagrants, kids. Um, ours is not an actual cut through, and we try to keep the readage sort of there so that the kids can't use that as a cut through. But we'd like to know sort of how the housing corporation might help mitigate some of the safety issues for their residents and possibly in the planning the lighting of that to uh, help mitigate a few of those problems that arise when it is well lit, unfortunately. So what problems when it is well lit or it yeah. needs to be well lit or less well lit? I'm yeah, no, I know, I know. It's, it's not, it sounds counterintuitive. It needs to be like Goldilocks lit? Or no, yeah. <laughs> so the area where the, um, the Park Street stairs meet the bike right, path, okay, yeah. where you get just that little bit of residual light from Arlington Pole Lumber, okay. tends to be a congregating point for local youth, and we've had to call the police a number of times. Okay. Empty beer bottles, that kind of thing. Any part along that path that has that same little light zone tends to have that same problem. So for the safety of the people at the end of our street, we tend to keep the weeds there slightly overgrown so they, the kids aren't jumping over the bike path there. I would hate to see the residents start to have a problem with people seeing this well-lit path and starting to use that as that same sort of 
well, congregate point. Can I speak from my personal experience living at the Goldboa House? When I first moved in, there were teenagers in the woods every night, fires, drinking, noise, screaming, all kinds of things. Every morning I would go out, every evening I would go out as they were going to and saying, okay, you know, last night you promised me you wouldn't leave the beer bottles. They're, they're not there. They haven't been there for two years. They, they were gone within three months. All you have to do is have presence, and this is a well-known urban issue. If you have presence in the area, the kids aren't going to hang out because they don't want to be seen. They don't want you to be calling the police. It's a very easy thing to take care of. It's been ongoing in our area for at least the seven years. Spend more time outside on your street, and I, they will disappear. They will not congregate on the street. It's not, Personal on our, experience. it's not on our street. It's on the bike path is the problem that I'm talking about. And I'm worried about the safety of your residents having that problem when they're using the bike path late at night. But we will have hundreds of residents, basically, who will, I mean, they'll be, they'll be there. Their presence will tend to move the problem away. Right now, isn't there at the end of your street there's kind of an informal entry? No, uh, there's not. There's an actual barrier there, and there are weeds oh. that we keep there for that reason oh, because yeah. we don't okay. want the and the town has been very helpful in making sure that it's not a formal access okay. path. The access okay. path is right. good. Yeah, it, I think I think the last time I went down, somebody put a plank in place. You know, yeah. <laughs> the kind of nuisance <laughs> you're talking about. I think. But I mean, another thing that we that, that we could do on, on our end of it, it's also, it's also and, and I don't think we've talked in any great deal about it with Pam, so part of Pam, yeah. uh, is uh, security cameras um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, for you know covering our area. Should something happen, you say, you know, that's going to come. Our tenants are very good at calling police. Thank you. Um, this might be related, and this might be. David address. Oh, I'm sorry, Alexandra Rowell, 88 Westminster Ave. Um, this might be related, and um, I was curious about the, the path going down. So I had thinking about how we would access that from coming up from our Gilboa neighborhood. And do we just walk down the driveway, like right in the middle of the driveway where cars are headed? No, there's, a, there's, a, side there's a walk. So, there's okay. a sidewalk that connects that, that connects the sidewalk at the, at the right. public way, it runs along runs along this. This sidewalk comes in, joins here, and that's where the ramp and stairs start beginning to take you down the cross. Okay. So no, it's not down through the middle. It will cross the right of way, so you do have to pay attention at that point if there's a fire truck or, or if we decide to go ahead and yeah, drive in. Yeah, right. I mean, up. same as crossing a driveway anyway. Right, right, right. Yes, sir. The Pierre Collision Point in North on Port North Street. A uh, couple things. Uh, first of all, I, I am, as you are, in favor of. Uh, these types of projects in general. And I think the Broadway design is a, a good example of something that's pretty well done for the area. If you know that street, that's a pretty nice solution to a problem that's been ongoing for 50 years that I can recall. Uh, but in terms of fitting, I think one of you guys called it a monolith, I forgot who. Uh, and I hate to say that because I don't need to be offensive, but uh, if somebody used, somebody used the Sunrise Living as an example, I know you don't want to sacrifice a floor to get the gable effect. Uh, I've spent a lot of time the past couple weeks looking at different developments with the neighborhoods. Um, I think this would be a great place for a neighborhood that butted up against the neighborhood off of Lowell Street. You know, four or five, two family homes, maybe a three family home. Something different at the corner that sort of blended in to what you call their transition. I don't really see a whole lot of transition, there's still a giant shoebox. Uh, that's number one. So I think a neighborhood would be great back there with some two or three family homes that would be a neighborhood. This is, I think somebody needs to look at the definition of urban and suburban. This is the suburbs. This is not a city block. Again, that's the city block, no matter how you change the windows or whatever you do. Uh, number two, read the uh, article in The Advocate the other day, and I got the impression that it was saying there's no impact traffic-wise, but now I hear from the horse's mouth that well, we didn't really talk about and we didn't look at all the things that really and truly matter. So now I'm hearing something different than what I read. And I've been told no impact at all. Um, so who's culpable? 
when there is an impact. When we look five years down the road and go, oh, I guess that report was completely wrong. Or that, you know, what what do we do at that point? Um, number, and what is the plan when something goes wrong? Uh, the other thing is, we've talked about solar and shadow reports and all that, um, and a screen up on top, talked about net zero. You've got to have a 30 degree pitch on a very large solar panel for that roof. I don't think the, sol I don't think the shadow plan takes that into account, the size of those. So from what I can see, the winter solstice, everybody on Lowell Street is never going to be able to have a solar panel. People on Lowell Street place cannot do that. Um, summer solstice, east is over here, west is over there. So when the sun's coming right up that thing, they're only going to get three hours of sun. So both those streets, none of those people are going to be able to put solar on their homes. Um, I feel kind of bad for them. Um, so the question is, if the report says something, and we all look at reality in a couple of years and it was wrong, who, who do we go to? If everybody says there's never going to be parking on your street where you live, don't worry about it, don't worry about the kids coming up and down, where do I go when that was wrong? Or, you know, people who didn't show up tonight, I all talked to them all, and they said, why are you going? This is just going to get jammed down your throat anyway. Why are you wasting your time? And I don't like to say that because I don't like to think things like that, but that seems to be a lot of the consensus that's going on. Um, so I'd like to know about the height of the panels, if that's been included, if that's going to actually happen. Um, net zero is fantastic to say, but just saying it's got to have big walls so doesn't really help. Um, and one of you said that this doesn't dominate the landscape, one of the designers. Uh, I can't think of anything more dominating than what I'm looking at. Um, and if you're using the height of Lowell Street as your curb height, you get the height of the building, which lets you achieve you know, 10 feet, still 8, 9, 10 feet taller than the closest building. And it really is very easy to show on a plan all the adjacent homes. I could do them through a sketch of it an hour. Um, so I, I'm, just, I'm just baffled by, by what the neighbors are going to have to face to design. Can we come up with some kind of a neighborhood design that matches the neighborhoods? Because again, this is suburb. This is not urban. We seem to be forgetting that. I just look at those photos, and that's not suburban. Um, so suburban, parking, parking on my street, design panels with people, and who's culpable when these reports that we're being told are not reality? <coughs> I can answer one of those questions for you. Okay. Okay. Go over. The, the, there is a zoning enforcement officer in yeah. town, and so if it turns out that these things are done incorrectly or are not appropriate, I mean, there's always the option of reopening special permit and having things. It's hard to show that. So what do you do? As a, as a Up to the zoning enforcement officer who sits on the board. I, mean, I, can't, I can't sit here and answer what ifs. I can tell you what the answer is. Yeah. I can't tell you what, what the what ifs would be, but there there are there are procedures in place to to assist neighbors, and, and, and we're here we're hearing all these concerns. Yeah. No vote's taking place. I tell you, no vote's going to take place tonight. Yeah. So we're, we're all we're all hearing this. We're no, all I appreciate it, the whole process. Trying to to come up with a solution. Yeah. So thank you. I'll the applicant thank you. Thank you. To make one comment on the solar panels. Yeah. Solar panels are not casting any shadow. They're, they're flat, and they're at the level of the parapet. The cat, uh, shadows that are cast that have any impact are the north parapet on the building and the west parapet. So the, there's zero impact from solar panels. So the dome pitch is like every other flat room has a They will be flat PV panels. PV panels that are south-facing are actually best flat. Yeah, You're probably thinking of solar hot water. Solar hot water panels of solar thermal will sit at an angle, PV panels sit flat. Thank you. Yes, sir, back. Yes, John Lynch, Grove Street, town meeting member for Precinct 17. A uh, couple of questions. With this site has already been, let's say, declared or decided a hazardous waste, a hazardous site. If this project doesn't go through, is it my understanding that the town is liable to clean it up? It's not town plan. Private owner. Well, who, who, I mean, we wouldn't just let the, the hazard sit there. Somebody would have to clean it up, right? Like any other, like any other land that's polluted, the owners and past owners have to deal with it. The town has nothing to do with being an owner. So they would be instructed by the town to take. It's, it's no, whatever the, the federal laws are. The Corporation of Arlington is not an Arlington town. It's not 
town department. It's a separate nonprofit entity that works with the town and in the town, but it is not all. Yeah, but I was saying if the project doesn't go through, you can step Environmental the issues like that are not town issues. They're, They're not. state and federal issues. So, so there's, there's a DEP directive that will tell the owners what and how to clean those up. That doesn't have to okay, so so what when and, how, and when and how. So measures will be taken to clean it up. I can't answer that. It's, it's not this well board. beyond where we this okay. And also too with the with the gentleman uh, from the tax committee and I think what this other gentleman was talking about. There was an article in the Advocate this week, and it talked about, if I may quote, according to the study, the current existing conditions monitored at Lowell Street, west of Downing Square, shows that there are 552 trips in the morning peak hour and 532 in the afternoon peak hour. Now, I'm not trying to be sarcastic in any way, but I've been driving for over 50 years. And I guess what they're talking about is morning rush hour here and afternoon rush hour. And I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no such thing as rush hour. It's actually rush hours. So these figures, I don't think, could be that accurate because there's no peak hour. Everybody who's ever driven a car knows rush hour is not one hour long. We, so it, we understand that. It, it is something to keep in and mind. Someone who travels through that section frequently yeah. during rush hour, yeah. hour, I understand that. Yeah. I just thought and I'd, 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 I'd that's, why we've asked, that's why we've asked Tappan to get involved. Thank you. I have a feeling there will be more questions asked. Hi, I'm Mary Ann Morrison, I'm with Drode. I'm also a member of HEA's board, and I just want to go on record as being in strong support of this project. Um, I think our two most recent projects, um, the, what I consider the iconic blue and burgundy house on the curve of Mass Ave and on the corner of Forest Ave and what I think is the very classy renovation we did to Cap Square are very emblematic of the kind of work that we do and I think um, the community and the board have raised some really good questions. I think you see that we're addressing them and at the end when, when many of these concerns are addressed I think we're moving in that direction and we'll continue to. I think you'll see that we will be the good neighbor that we are and continue to be the good tax paying neighbor and I urge that when your questions are satisfactor satisfactorily addressed that you will issue a permit. Time is somewhat of the essence um, because in order, I think Pam Pellet mentioned this at our last hearing, in order for us to get our financing package into DHCD, um, I think we we need to kind of move forward, which means there's a lot of work for HCA to do to answer your questions. But I appreciate your approval of the Broadway project because they're combined financing package. And I hope uh, you will agree this, this is going to um, add a small but significant um, number of units to our undisputed affordable housing project. Thank you. Thank you. Just a comment, Kim Fetchell, 46 Marion Road, and I'm also here representing St. Paul Lutheran Church, which is up on 920 Highland, I think, in the Heights. And we just want to go on record strongly supporting the project. We really appreciate the work that Housing Corporation of Arlington is doing to develop these projects. And uh, we, as a congregation, as well as other Arlington congregations, are contributing financially to some of these projects because we think it, the affordable housing is so important. As an individual person who lives on Marion Road, um, I have encountered in my 20 years living in this town numerous people who are kids and people who grow up in Arlington and say, we really want to be in Arlington. We can't afford to live here. So we just want to go on record strongly supporting the project and hope that we can you know, get like the other projects. I live right by the Capitol uh, program. I wait in the bus with people who live there. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. So I hand over. Here, sir. Uh, Dave Bourbon, uh, Two Reservoir Road. Um, lived there quite a while. Uh, biked back and forth to work for about 20 years um, until uh, the corporation moved me to Lowell from Waltham. So, uh, you know, uh, it's a little bit too far. Um, <laughs> but uh, I. And I do provide the only access right now to the bike path 
for people from Lexington to come down Lowell Street and other locations because I'm the one that the property they go over in order to access that particular point. Uh, and I am on Google Maps <laughs> for whatever it's worth. Um, What's the address on Two Reservoir Road. Um, so my, my main concern is that, you know, people can bicycle for a while and uh, we all get older. <coughs> I haven't found a way to stop it. Um, and people will acquire cars. So parking spaces need to be available. I mean, and you are in a flood zone for this development. Um, and a lot of triple deckers, you can put them on the pillars, park underneath. I mean, there are, you know, things that could be done, may not be as quite as dense as what you originally laid out here, but it may fit in more with the general neighborhood of having triple deckers versus, and since it is already lower down than a lot of the other houses. I realize some of the roof lines may be difficult as far as shadowing uh, because sunlight, you know, as obviously from the sunset development that was originally approved and they promised it was only going to be 40 feet high and lo and behold, you know, we got this behemoth and now I have shade from uh, you know two o'clock on every day for the next uh, you know month and a half or so, which I take and I was told it would never happen. That was what you know was promised to me, and that was my only request. And that was just a big lie. I don't know from who you know or the group or whatever, but. You know, I went in and said that it would throw a shadow that covers my house, which it does late in the day. Anyways, all I'm saying is people are going to need cars and they need a spot, a place to park their car. Uh, you know, I've taken the bus, <coughs> I still take the bus, uh, but, you know, I have a car too. Uh, so. I don't, I, I see that happening for most of the residents. And anyone that says anything else is just sort of living in denial. Thank you. I'm gonna ask any other comments, uh, kept as brief as possible. We're getting late, we're about to lose a member for the evening. Uh, <coughs> we will most likely be continuing this to a further hearing. There will still be comments accepted. Matt. Yeah. Uh, my name is Doug, Doug Treviston, and I'm at the 1302 Gilmore Trail, Fairbanks, Alaska. So you, you might be wondering why you know, a guy who's at the edge of the earth, as it were, is here testifying. Well, my daughter and uh, her husband and young child live on Westminster Ave, and we spent about now about a month in Alaska and then a month <coughs> down here and uh, because of the grandkids, which is great. And uh, I really enjoy this community. Um, I want to make a couple observations or ask you two questions. Uh, but first, though, I want to compliment this board. I think you're doing a fine job of the public process. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to me to hear you know, how it's working and the expertise that's available uh, on this board. I also want to compliment the people that are here tonight, both those that are for and both as those that are that are, you know, kind of wavering a little bit. Uh, the comments are really insightful. They don't necessarily repeat each other. They add information, and uh, they're civil. And that, that doesn't always happen. Um, but here, here's, here, here's my question. Uh, to me, there's two issues here, or two questions. One is, can this project be done? And from what I've heard here tonight and, and in the record in the last meeting, yes, this project can be done. The zoning's there, the, the height's right. You got the right water pressure for your hydrants, you know. You got, you, you know, that, that's true, it can be done. But the larger question to me, in what I'm perceiving, 
is should it be done? Now, where that last decision gets made, I don't know where that is. Uh, this board, to me, is the can it happen? And pretty clearly it can. But maybe you can enlighten me as a visitor. Uh, where is that second question answered? Should it be done? That's why we're holding this public process. So are you the board then that decides the should? Partly, mostly, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, questions? Christine Van Walker on a um, tenant at 34 Forest Street and uh, for this project. And I know you're talking about lighting and you know aesthetics and all that, but the ultimate goal is for people that can live in Arlington affordably Unfortunate and, and thankful my daughter gets to go to the high school. And I just thank you. Yes, ma'am. Janice Bakey, 15 I'm not finished. I'm not finished. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was very sick when I applied for my housing and without this housing I would not be able to afford to live anywhere. And there's a lot of people out there that can't afford to live in Massachusetts at all. And I'm very grateful and I was a single parent and I was very sick and these people are very compassionate and love Arlington for the project. Thank you. Janice 15 Pound Road. I wasn't going to speak, um, but I guess in hearing you speak, I grew up here at a time when it wasn't affluent. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. We did own our house to a family. And um, the concern is, where do you keep that economic diversity, mm -hmm. especially around any radius of Boston? But it is a good community, it's got good schools. How do you keep your kids safe with also good education? Mm -hmm. Near public transportation at Arlington has always treasured itself for heaven. And if we're not gonna build near those pathways of public transportation, I don't know where, you know, how we're gonna resolve this. So I just want to be very supportive. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Good evening, Mr. Rowley, Mr. Uh, one, I have a question, um, which is about uh, the design. You did mention about some uh, potential sprinkler systems and maybe a fire pump, and that would probably pull in an emergency generator. Does the project have a generator, an emergency power generator? Not at this point. But, well, let me be really clear. We haven't done construction documents. We're nowhere near because of the timing. We can't really advance until we have secure funding. Right. So that, that would be, that's a, a code issue. The building code is about to change. We haven't designed the building yet through that level. If we, so let me say, if we need to increase the water pressure, we will in order to run the sprinkler system. And if we need emergency power to back that up, we would provide that. Great, that leads right into my, my question, um, in the question for RP, uh, which is uh, when we put a generator, emergency generator in, we have to put a stack 10 feet above the height of the building, it's a DP regulation. Um, you have your screen showing your mechanicals. Um, clearly it's not showing the total project because we haven't designed it fully. How do we address down the road if we say we decide to have an emergency generator, therefore we need to have a stack that's higher than the top of the building at 10 feet, how does that process work in? Uh, well, quite simply, the, the um, I can answer. The height of the, the zoning ordinance in terms of the, the set height of the building defines it as the top of the roof, not the top of you know equipment on a roof. And it actually specifically excludes, you could have a penthouse that's a third the size of the roof that goes up 12 feet. So yeah. my question was, it wasn't exactly uh, um, for the zoning aspect okay. of it. It was more about at the add height, no matter what that height is, we create additional shadowing, the visual, the aesthetics of it, the screen goes up. Well, well, let me point out one kind of important fact, and the reason I brought up the building code is right now, 
the building code doesn't require an emergency generator to power up a fire pump, and there's a really good reason for that, because fire departments bring their trucks, and they have pumps on them, and they like to hook up and be 100% assured of pressure. So at this point, we, we the only reason we put in an emergency generator is it would be part of a resiliency plan or some other reason other than the fire plan. I'm really more making the point that as we're designing the, the building and we have, don't have a full design, our total height isn't actually real. And so it potentially down the road may change, and I just want to consider that as we as move <coughs> if, forward. If, 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 I, know you, I knew you were here for the prior hearing, sure. where we'd have to have final review over any building construction documents, things like that. So that would also apply in this case. If they were to go above the height and be subject, come back in front of us and work on that with this kind of questioning scrutiny to make sure that that wasn't impacted. That's the question. That's exactly yeah, happened no, down, no, down the road in the future, there'd be an additional special permit process where the same thing would have to happen. Um, kind of like when we said to them earlier, when they bring in tenants, those tenants would have to come in front of us to make sure the use is appropriate under bylaws. Excellent. My, my last comment uh, is uh, for the corner is agreeing with your comment, is that it just doesn't feel welcoming to the neighborhood. Uh, there's that boxy uh, look that we had from the, down the end here. Just wanted to sort of, as we hit that point, the gable roof, while not ideal for the total allowable occupancy, does really soften as a potential option for us, and I would encourage that. Uh, I also want to come in, you guys are doing a great job, and uh, the project on Broadway is, uh, is going to be a great project. I like the design. Thank you. Take these last two comments, and this, sir, we're going to have to continue to hear. Uh, my name is Ed Trumbly. I live on Wright Street. Uh, I, I was uh, interested in the comment about dumpsters. You know, dumpsters that roll out to uh, Lowell Street are all well and good for nine months out of the year. But uh, there's about three months where dumpsters don't roll very well. And there's probably no place on Lowell Street to put it. I think they're talking about plastic bins, sir. They're not talking Pines. about metal dumpsters. Pines. They're not, we're not talking about dumpsters. So we're not talking about no, rolling plastic we're not. dumpsters? we're not, oh, Rolling dumpsters, okay, that's no. Um, I also, this, uh, the house on the corner of uh, Lowell and Park Ave, that's a six unit building, right? Yes, yes. And, and I don't see any parking attached. The parking for the full the project the full is project the 23. So, so are the 23. The, the, the six cars that will be attached to that building will have to park way in the back. There isn't necessarily There's six not cars. There's necessarily assigned parking, and there will necessarily be six cars. I see. So, so you're making the assumption that, that, that there will be just one, less than one car per unit. Uh, yes. <coughs> Yes, the, that's the, the proposal. The proponent has put in place certain incentives to disincentivize car ownership of the project. Okay, interesting. So I'm also curious about the, uh, the, the, the line between the uh, Citgo station. Uh, I'm not sure how the elevations are going to work there. So could, could somebody help me understand? Sorry, how, uh, how you deal with the significant difference in elevation between the Citgo station and the, uh, well, I think, the, the, height, the, the height sidewalks and the driveways. You're talking about grade. You're talking about land. You're talking about well, not only the grade, but uh, you know, I look at the plan here, and there's a uh, property line that seems to almost touch the, uh, the gas yeah. touch the uh, driveway and touch the. Uh, handicap parking next to the 6 unit building. That's a, that's a right of way. That's yeah, I know that's a right of way, but it's also got an elevation difference of something like 10 feet. So is that going to have a retaining wall? How do you how do you how do you have um, an elevation difference of almost 10 feet, unless I'm misunderstanding something, uh, between the driveway and the corner of that property, which is. Uh, Right there on the curb, and then in the back of the building, there's, there's a lot of all are you talking Yeah, right. Right about where your fingers. Yeah. The elevation at that corner is somewhere between 157 and 156, about 156 and a half, and that's right now. I mean, the grade, you know, kind of comes up like that's the grade line for one 
153, 154, 155. I, I'm not seeing a, a 10 foot well, chain. So what's the right? elevation on the, uh, let's say, at the end of the gas pumps here? Let's see what's there. So I hate to do this, but I have to leave. Uh, I have to pick up my daughter at uh, the airport who's coming back from college and her mother is going to kill me if I don't. And so, um, for, so for reasons of, for unfortunately, reasons of forum, we, need to we need to close the, close the hearing this evening, continue into our next meeting, December 5th. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm sorry to anybody else who didn't get a chance to speak tonight. Uh, I'll remember you. My apologies. The next hearing, you call in first. You can also email me. I think all of our email addresses are on the town website. Uh, I'm happy to take additional comment. We will be taking additional comment at our next hearing, and we'll try to meet earlier. So thank you thank all. You, thank you. you. Before anybody does anything, yeah, so please continue it. Yeah, so I, I move to continue the hearing until uh, December 5th. Okay, December 5th. Okay. Yeah. All in favor. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Sorry.